Will Nate Johnson, Bryson Barnes, or someone else be Utah's backup quarterback by the time spring ball closes? We're talking about it on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Lockdown News your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment matter more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. My name is JT Wisto, former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department, and on today's show, talking quarterback two in a moment. Also diving into some of the other Pac-12 contenders. And look, Utah, they want to be Pac-12 champs. What's the best way to do that? You got to beat those other teams. So how do those other top teams in the Pac-12 look heading into spring ball? And a quick thing on Utah basketball and basketball in the Pac-12 as March Madness continues to heat up and how the Pac-12 can find themselves back in the thick of the March Madness rage in the future going forward. And in order to help me digest all of that, it's friend of the show and the host of Locked on Pac-12, Spencer McLaughlin. Spencer, starting with Utah quarterback two, you know, this team's in a very interesting spot because Cam Rising is not going to be involved in spring ball. He's still going to be recovering from the injury he sustained in the Rose Bowl, the torn ACL. And as he kind of gets back from that and progresses this, there's no certainty that he's going to be available for game one. So that makes the back quarterback job so important. And I think, look, Brandon Rose will have a shot at it. That's a name a lot of people have thrown out. But to me, it's much more about Bryson Barnes versus Nate Johnson. I just have a hard time seeing a guy like Brandon, whose skill set is similar to Bryson Barnes, beating out Bryson when Bryson's already done so many good things. He helped the team get a win against Washington State last year. Yeah, he came up short in the Rose Bowl, but that's because we saw how a Herculean effort from Cam in the first half to keep Utah in that game. So when you took him out, then Utah beat Washington State because that was a team when it wasn't Bryson coming in and putting the team on his back. That's what he would have had to do to beat Penn State. He's not that. He's just not that guy, honestly. So that's where you hope a guy like Nate Johnson can develop and come along and really have a chance to take it. And I do feel like this will be Nate Johnson's job by the end of spring ball. I just feel like he's such a dynamic and athletic quarterback. I think he's going to make a ton of strides as a thrower too over the offseason working hard. He wants the opportunity to be the next quarterback for this Utah team. And I do think it will end up being him. But just as someone from the outside who covers the Pac-12 as a whole, what do you think about the prospect of Cam not being available? And how do you feel about those other guys I just listed? Well, it makes it less ideal that you have to start with Florida and then Uh go to Baylor. And then your tune-up game is in week three. That's suboptimal timing for the Utes if you're going to start the year without a Cam Rising. But it's hard to look at what Bryson Barnes has done as a backup and not think that he's the leader in the clubhouse Mm -hmm. going into spring football. Now, a lot of that stuff can change. But when you look at Nate Johnson, what he would represent is a need to kind of shift the offensive philosophy a little bit, right? I mean, he's a younger player. He's not as experienced, but his skill set is very different than Bryson Barnes. And frankly, I think stylistically could even be better based on what I know about him than Cam Rising. So is he a guy who you can line up under center for 80% of his snaps like you do with Cam? Or is he someone who needs to be in the shotgun more and you have to introduce more quarterback runs and you're going to run more, you you know, spread RPO concepts? I think that's kind of the push and pull. And and Kyle Whittingham and Andy Ludwig, they know what they want to be offensively. They know what they are and what they have been offensively. So I I would think it'll be Barnes because he represents the greatest continuity for for the offense, you know, not just from a familiarity standpoint, but from a style standpoint, right? Like you're running the exact same offense. You know, Barnes can move, I think not quite as well as Cam from Mm -hmm. what I've seen, but if you need him to every now and then. But frankly, if you wanted to go, like Utah executes those quarterback runs in the red zone really, really well. Mm -hmm. Like they do a great job with them. They call them at the right time. I I love quarterback runs in the red zone. They're one of my favorite plays to run in NCAA 14, but they work in real life as well. (laughs) I could see a scenario where you you don't have a dual quarterback system because I'm opposed to that on all levels, but you have a specific red zone package for for Nate Johnson who could then, you know, afford to be a little bit more reckless with his feet if you want to get the quarterback run game in there. And so I, I think you could see a little bit of that specifically down you know inside the 15 10 yard line but I I think you want to go with with Barnes I mean he went into Pullman last year and beat a really solid Washington State team right 
That that's that's not a small thing. And yeah, the team had to step up and help him. But that's always been Utah's identity. They've they've mm-hmm. never been a team that has you know been driven by the quarterback consistently. That is having guys put up three hundred and three hundred fifty yards. Like they don't have a a, a Michael Penix or a, a, mm-hmm. a Marcus Mariota or you know somebody like that who can really carry your offense to a bunch of points. That's not what they do. So if I'm Kyle Whittingham, I, I'd go with Barnes, and I I, I suspect that they would. You're right, because you look at games like you, right the USC game at Rice Eccles Stadium. That was an aberration from Cam and Dalton Kincaid. It wasn't every single week Cam Rising was doing stuff while the defense was just getting gashed play after play. So I absolutely agree. And look, Kyle Whittingham is a guy who doesn't trust easily, and he does trust Bryson Barnes as the backup quarterback of this team. So it is going to take a lot from someone else to unseat him as the backup. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over spring ball. Spencer, the other thing I'm curious to get your thoughts on, because for me, the biggest question for Utah spring ball, they have to figure out isn't even the quarterback too, because by the time Pac-12 play at least kicks in, that's when we expect Cam to be back. So we know at some point Cam's coming back. So to me, that's not a biggest concern is left tackle because you look, Braden Daniels is gone after having an outstanding season. Those of me, it's much more important to get the left, tack- left tackle spot solidified and figured out. But as someone who's looking at the Pac-12 as a whole, I'm curious, what is your biggest question about this Utah football team going in the spring ball how do you replace clark phillips i I don't have questions about the tight end position because i know what i've got there right i think yasmin is a really solid number two tight end and i think what you have coming back with with brant keithy gives you everything you had with kincaid and more because remember keithy was ahead of dalton kincaid on the depth chart until Keithy got hurt and Kincaid showed what he can do. And he's now probably going to be an early to mid round draft pick deservedly. So Crazy. as, as a result, right? I mean, that's a guy taking advantage of an opportunity, but I'm not concerned about that loss, but I watched what happened to Utah's defense when Clark Phillips wasn't on the field. That's a high impact player, right? And he's a big, big time corner. And yeah, I, I have a tendency to trust Kyle Whittingham defensively and, and what they're able to put together. But that's just such a – he was so big so many times. I mean, he did, mm-hmm. didn't he have multiple pick sixes against Oregon State? Sounds I, – I, in that game, I believe he just had two – inters- he had well, three interceptions he, overall. Yeah, he had three interceptions. Six. and I he think had a lot one, of pick six during his yeah, time. And, and one, yeah, and one was a pick six. Like, that, that sort of player just doesn't come around very often. Yeah. So I look at the Utah defense, which has been so critical to their success over the last several years, and they've been, make no mistake about it, the best program – in the Pac-12 for for the last four years. In the last four full seasons of college football, they've played in the in the uh, Pac-12 title game, right? Yeah. Uh, 2020 does not count. It was not exactly. real, it was not real football. No. 18, 19, 21, 22, they've been there, right? Now they're here, but I think people are taking them a little bit more seriously. You now it's taken longer than it should have for people <laughs> who have gotten to that point, but that's where we're at. And so I I think they're starting to have a little bit of, of being the hunted a little bit more, you know, from a, a tone and a preparations and a mindset standpoint for a lot of these players. I think you certainly have that with USC. Uh, of course, they've got uh, a bone to pick with Utah, but I don't, or no, yeah, the Utes will play USC oh, at yes. USC this right. year, not at, uh, not at Rice Eccles. But I, I, I think that defensively is where the question comes in because we've seen Utah's defense be really good at times. But then we've seen them have some letdowns, right? The Rose Bowl, each of the last couple of years, has not been the Utah defense that it was during Pac-12 play. And that's not, I think, an indictment on the Pac-12. I think it's an indictment on the players they haven't had going into each of those Rose Bowls. Clark Phillips and then the, the secondary injuries you know, uh, against Ohio State. So that, that, that's what I'm wondering, is when you lose a player of that caliber, how much of that production can you replace? Who's going to step up? And I think that's a big question for them going forward as they look uh, to spring football on the defense. It definitely is. And I think Zamaya Vaughn can step up, but I don't expect him to have a Clark Phillips type season. So it's going to put more pressure on guys like JT Broughton, like the Miles Battle of the world who's transferring it over from Ole Miss. The Fabian Marks of the world have kind of been waiting in the wings a little bit. Maybe they step up and get an opportunity, but there is no Clark Phillips on this team. So it will be interesting to see as you don't have – the guy who is overall an eraser. And yeah, like there were times last year where Clark would get beat, but that's just going to happen. And there's a reason that the best corners, when they get matched up against the best receivers, yeah, maybe one game they hold them under 30 yards, but then the next you'll see that same receiver go for over 80 or 90 yards because it's just hard to hold great players in check. And 
nice to have a guy who can do that consistently. This Utah team does not have a surefire guy without Clark who can do that. So it's going to be fascinating to see how they're able to handle that challenge going forward and to see who steps up during spring ball. And speaking of spring ball, Utah football is not the only team that's going to be enter entering spring football in the Pac-12. We're going to come back in a moment and talk about the other Pac-12 contenders and their biggest questions as it pertains to their success in 2023. We're going to touch on that in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys about our friends and the sponsor of this episode in FanDuel Sportsbook. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to the point scored to threes drained. There's even exclusive bets like a, th a two times three, two three-pointers scored in the first three minutes. You can also handle the money line. There are great things you can do. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment matter more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Spencer, when you're talking about the other contenders in the Pac-12, I got six on here that I think have... Now, there's some I feel better about than others about their chance to win, but I think six at least that are really worth mentioning and talking about and a couple that... Look, just there's going to be a lot of hype around cough, cough, Colorado, of course. So first, starting off with USC, I think my biggest question about the Trojans is can that defense improve? I was actually talking a little bit yesterday about, you know, Alec Grinch has been with Lincoln Riley a while now, and he's the defensive guru, and they haven't been able to turn the defense around at Oklahoma, and they couldn't in the first year, but they did bring in a lot of recruits who were pretty young. So I, I feel like the defense will be improved next year, but definitely the biggest question because look when you got Caleb Williams coming back I don't care that Jordan Addison's gone honestly I that offense is going to be fine with Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley at the helm yeah I I think that's the pretty clear and obvious question for for USC and I I've got no doubts that they're going to be a, a contender in the Pac-12 because if you have Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams there's mm -hmm. just too much talent there for anything else to happen. And USC can get skill position players at will. They bring them in in the portal. They bring them in from the high school ranks. Like their offensive line and running game is good enough. And Caleb Williams is just the focal point of everything that they do. And it's a pretty good guy to base your football team around because he's the reigning best player in college football and future number one pick in, in the 2024 NFL draft and, and deservedly. So that's the guy who mm -hmm. I would take if I were literally, and I would, I would pass on quarterbacks this year, tank again for the opportunity <laughs> to draft Caleb Williams. I am really, really high on that guy. I know Utah fans might not like him very much, but he is a I'm ridiculous with you. football player. Yes, he is. R r ridiculously good. So I, I don't expect USC's defense to make some big leap because I, yeah. I've, I've seen this narrative before. I've seen this story mm -hmm. before. A Lincoln Riley coach team yep. gets pushed around on, on defense – Alex Grinch is the defensive coordinator. They've got an explosive offense, and they win a bunch of football games. I watched that happen for several years at Oklahoma. I have no indication. It's not like Oklahoma is some scrub recruiting school and like, oh, you can't get recruits out mm -hmm. there, and now he can at USC. Like, yeah, your recruiting ceiling is higher at USC. It's not in a different galaxy compared to what oh. it was at Oklahoma. But they weren't able to bring in the sorts of players that they were able to then develop into high-quality defensive players. It's just not a part of their culture. It's just not a priority. That's not what Lincoln Riley does. And frankly, that's okay. He knows what he is. He knows what he can do. And what he can do is score a bunch of points. And guess what? They're going to score a bunch of points. And last time I checked, if you score more than the other team, that's kind of the objective here on – a weekly basis. So I, I don't suspect there'll be much of a pullback. Like you can talk about the defense for USC holding them back from getting to the playoff as it did in 2022 or winning a national championship as it did at, at Oklahoma. But the, the floor here is just so high yeah. that you, you can't look at them and say, oh, their defense stinks. They're going to pull back. Like, no. They're going to be as good, maybe better as a team. Because remember, that was year one mm -hmm. after a four and eight season. Now they've got some returning players, including Caleb Williams and, and some other notable ones. Like that, that's going to be a really, really good football team. And yeah, the defense is always a question, but the offense is not. And there are not a lot of teams that can look at one side of the ball and say, not only do I have no questions here. I have zero doubts that they'll be one of, if not the best in the conference. Yeah, I mean, once again, it really does start with Caleb Williams, too, because of just his, he's just incredible. I mean, 
if he doesn't get hurt in the Pac-12 championship, I still believe Utah wins that game. I know it's not closer with how he was. I mean, my gosh, they got hurt on. He had another like 60 yard run, basically <laughs> just, he just gassed you. It's on the ground all season. So truly an incredible player. And no matter what form of defense they get, the Trojans are going to be fine. And moving on to our next team, we focused on the defensive side of the ball for Oregon, the kind of the second team I'm really looking at, like a contender in the pack. I'm going to flip to the offense a little bit. And yes, you got Bo Nix coming back, but you know, you lose Kenny Dillingham and him and Bo Nix worked really well together last year. So I am curious to see, you know, Bo Nix did have his best season last year. Is there going to be a little bit of aggression there just because Kenny Dillingham is gone? I really do like what Oregon is putting together right now, what Coach Landing is doing up there. But whenever you lose an offensive coordinator, especially one who had as much sex as Kelly Kenny Dillingham, and there's a reason that he is now at the head coach at Arizona State, too, that I just think that's the question is, can the offense keep the same momentum? Yeah, I I have more questions about the defense taking a step forward because the personnel for Oregon offensively is really good. But I don't even think the offensive coordinator position is the biggest offensive question. It's the offensive line. Hmm. And they've brought in a lot of talent on the offensive line, and they already had a lot of talent on the offensive line. But that group working well together is about chemistry and experience. Mm -hmm. And they had one of the best offensive lines in program history a year ago. And one of the best in the country. They ran the ball at a ridiculously efficient clip. That set up their play action game. And their pass protection with Bo Nix back there when he was healthy was outrageous. Right? Utah got a lot of pressure at Autzen Stadium on Bo Nix. That's mostly because he couldn't move. He was a statue. Mm -hmm. Right? But that combination was key to Oregon's offensive success last year. So going into 2023, I'm looking at the Ducks and saying, look, coordinators change all the time, but they've got to have the personnel to make it happen. At the skill positions, Oregon's got everything you need. Great quarterback in Bo Nix, who just set a program record for completion percentage, almost 72%. You've got a number one wide receiver in Troy Franklin. You've got a great number two they brought in from Alabama in Treshawn Holden. You've got slot guys. Tight end's a little bit of a question mark, but their number one tight end, Terrence Ferguson, I'll put him up against any tight end in the conference, including Brant Keithy. He's really, really good. And then you look at what they've got at the running back position. Bucky Irving, stud. Noah Whittington, baller. Jordan James, great short yardage back, who I think's got even more potential. They brought in some good young freshmen, too. There are no questions. It's just a question of depth chart and who's Mm -hmm. going to get the most touches, right? It's not, do they have enough talent there? They do. The question is the offensive line was such a key piece. It was such a key clog of what they did offensively. It was really at the core of what they did. Can they replicate that success? I think they're going to take a step back because last year you had a third-year starting left tackle. You had a third-year, second or third-year starting right tackle. You had a sixth-year center, (laughs) right? Who's the quarterback of that unit? Who's orchestrating? Who's got the calls? Now you have a guy who's primarily been playing guard in Jackson Powers Johnson looking like the starting center. What does that do to the chemistry? How many lapses do you have, right? It's reasonable to expect Oregon's offensive line to take a step back, but the question is how much will that happen? And then defensively, can you be, I don't know, competent against the pass? We'll find out. I mean, they they need a pass rush. Jordan Birch is a huge addition. Brandon Doyle is coming back is also big, but they've got to be able to get pressure on the quarterback. It was a historically bad season for Oregon getting after the passer. And, you know, it's not the best year to be questions about that with, all the talent going on in the Pac-12 at the quarterback spot. No, too, so it is, is not. Yeah, if is, you if you defensively in this league cannot mm-hmm. generate pressure, you're toast. Yeah, I mean Cam Ward is like the seventh best quarterback in the league. <laughs> I know, and that guy might make the NFL. Yeah, I mean le- legitimately, he's got those sorts yeah. of prospects. He's big, big arm, quick motion. He's got some decision making things to to kind of refine with his game, but. You, you got Michael Penix, you got Bo Nix, you've got DJU now at Oregon mm-hmm. State, Cam Rising, Caleb Williams, either Colin Schley or UC or uh, Dante Moore at UCLA. Either could be pretty solid. And then you've got Cam Ward, you've got Shador Sanders at Colorado. I haven't even mentioned Jaden Delora at Arizona, who I love and is an absolute baller. Like it's the you, best you quarterback have, conference by far. It's not. I I don't know that there's a second. No, yeah, I, I really too. don't. Not yeah. even the SEC. Like I look across yeah. and I'm like. Do you go nine deep? Exactly. Because the Pac-12 could be going nine deep with quality quarterbacks. I'm sure and, I'm missing someone, but off the top of my head, like the only quarterback when I think about college quarterback next year is uh, Drake May from North Carolina. Yep, he's good. Guy, Jordan Travis at Florida State is good. Yeah. 
the Michigan quarterback. But, but the play. ACC, that, the, all Pac-12 guys. Yeah, the ACC is not going is not going that deep. They lost Sam oh. Hartman from Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. He went to Notre Dame and DJU literally came. And I know people don't love DJU, but he was still yeah, he's Kate, still, yeah. He's a solid quarterback. Yeah, he was. And Kate Klubnick could be really good at Clemson, sure. But I just don't see another conference that can go eight or nine deep yes. where you could say that's a quality starting quarterback who can win you games. I 1,000% agree. And I think one last thing before we leave Oregon, I think one thing that's nice for Utah is I think about Spencer Fano. Spencer Fano is a recruit out of Utah. Offensive tackle came to Utah, one of the higher recruits to come in program history. Why is that important when we're talking about Oregon? Because the Oregon offensive line this year, you mentioned Jackson Powers Johnson. He went to Corner Canyon. That's in Utah. You also got a transfer from Texas named Junior. He went to East High School out in Utah. Those were the talented players you had leaving the state in the past to go join these other powerful programs. If Utah can keep those kind of players in state, we know how good Oregon offensive lines are. So the the fact that those guys were going out of state, it shows you how good they are to be able to go to programs like that. It's nice that Utah is starting to trend in the direction where they can keep some of those high powered players in and be interesting to see what they develop into. It'll be interesting to see how Oregon's offense and defense look because they can absolutely win the pack in Dan Lanning's second year. We're going to come back and talk about a few more of the contenders to win the conference in a moment. But first, we want to talk to you guys about the sponsor of this episode in UCCU. UCCU is opening a brand new branch in Vineyard. To celebrate, UCCU is giving away a 2023 Kawasaki Terry Times 4 UTV. The new branch offers all the benefits of a UCCU branch, multiple drive planes, 24-hour ATM, and UCCU's brand new interactive teller machines, or ITM for short, which provide all the benefits of meeting with a real UCCU professional, either in the branch or right from your vehicle. It's a virtual connection to a road teller with a highly personalized audio and video connection. So celebrate with UCCU, enter to win the 2023 Kawasaki Terry Times 4 UTV. Winners will be announced in April. But the entry deadline is March 31st, just days left for you to enter when your 2023 Kawasaki Terry Times 4 UTV stop by UCCU's new branch in Vineyard or enter to win at UCCU.com. Hurry, you don't want even have to be a member to enter at UCCU, so make sure you guys head over and enter today. There's no person necessary, and you guys can join at UCCU.com. UCCU, love where you bank. Spencer, the next thing we got to talk about is Washington. Michael Penix is incredible, and you were when you were talking about Oregon, you were talking about guys and NFL, and it just made me think about how I feel like Michael Penix is going to end up being this year's Hendon Hooker of the, or I should say, next year's Hendon Hooker in terms of draft wise. I feel like everyone will be enamored with Caleb Williams, Drake May too, and I feel like Michael Penix will be the guy who just kind of sneaks up on everyone because we saw how good he was, and we and he's going to continue that going forward. I have no questions about the offense because of Michael Penix, but. I do have questions about that defense because, I mean, they got gashed. I mean, they gave up 45 points to Arizona State, gave up 40 to UCLA, which there's not a ton of shame in that. But, I mean, gave up 28 to a Michigan State team that struggled a lot last season. There was, The Oregon game gave up 34. We saw it against Washington State. I know it's a rivalry, but still gave up 33. There was just a lot of instances last season where this defense did get gashed a couple of times. So that's my biggest question is can the defense match the pro productivity and how potent the offense is going to be? Well, I think defenses are put in a tough spot when you have an explosive high-flying offense because you're True. on the field a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> like Washington doesn't play slowly. They're not a methodical, grinded-out team. Like great defensive teams very rarely also have highly explosive offenses. Georgia is the exception and, and Alabama. Like that that's the exception, not the norm, right? You're tired. You're on the field more. Like you're going to inevitably – allow more points i think washington's front four is actually pretty nasty mm -hmm. and they bring back braylon trice and zion tupola fatui who are both really really good edge players and we talked about getting pressure on quarterbacks those guys can do it they, they can do it consistently the question for the huskies is the back end they were dealing with some injuries last year but even when they were close to full strength in the secondary you know their coverage was okay but man they couldn't tackle i mean they they just they could not tackle and utah i believe plays washington this year their approach washington. should be what what oregon's was who you know didn't lose that game against the huskies because of what their offense didn't do aside from one drive resulting in a field goal instead of a touchdown it was what their defense couldn't do but what oregon did in that game i mean they ran all over them they, I mean, yeah. washington could not tackle bucky irving they couldn't tackle noah whittington it, it was just a struggle for them all game long and that's when they were most vulnerable it's how a team like arizona state you know was able to to put up 45s like that was kind of the weak area so if they can get back to you know not necessarily i don't expect them to get back to what they were in the secondary when chris peterson and jimmy lake were there mm. i know jimmy lake was a terrible head coach but he was a great defensive coordinator and great mm. recruiter especially in the secondary if they can get some higher level players and just tacklers or, or just improve on that front in year two with Kalen DeBoer, 
then yeah, they they can do just fine. But I, I think they're going to have a real test this year because they snuck up on everybody last year. They didn't. They're not going to do that again. Number one, and then number two, their schedule is much tougher this year than last year because last year they played at UCLA, but they didn't. Uh, they didn't play Utah and they didn't play USC. Mm-hmm. So that's missing the two best teams yeah. in the South, right? Like from a yeah. from a scheduling standpoint. I know divisions aren't there anymore, but it still exists for for the final year from a scheduling standpoint. So that was a bit of a break. And so Washington's got a chance to prove that they weren't just fortunate on the scheduling front, you, you know, last year, getting to play both Arizona schools and playing UCLA, who was the weakest of kind of the three title contenders in the South last year. And, and, and they lost to him, right? So I, I think that's kind of where it's going to be for Washington. They're not going to sneak up anybody, and, and they have to prove it a bit because this year they do play USC and they do play Utah. And that's going to be a, a real test. And I think you could definitely see some shootouts in those games. But I, I've seen Kalen DeBoer win a lot of football games as a head coach. He knows what he wants to do, how he wants his teams to look, and I think Washington is mirroring that pretty well. They absolutely are. And, you know, you just talked about the shootouts they're going to be in, however you slice it. And we're going to talk about two other, three other teams, I should say, actually, in a second. But I do feel like some combination of Utah, USC, Oregon, and Washington are the clear top four for me as we enter at least spring ball and going into the season. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I think so. Um, Oregon <laughs> State. <Very> <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> they're my next team we're going to talk about, actually. They're right on the bubble for me. Yeah, Oregon State is really interesting because I think their quarterback play is elevated with yes. DJU, but I can't see how their defense doesn't take at least a slight step back. Mm-hmm. Like it was so good, right? They beat Oregon completing six passes in a game. That's mm-hmm. not sustainable, right? <laughs> like that defense was so good when they needed to be. And their secondary was amazing, but they lost Alex Austin and they lost Jaden Grant. Those are two big-time playmakers there. And they lost their middle linebacker, Omar Spates, who transferred down to LSU, which is what you'd call the SEC Pac-12 difference, especially when talking about Oregon State, right? Like, Mm -hmm. we we all understand what's happening there. So that's a lot to deal with. I think Trent Bray is brilliant as a defensive coordinator because their defense was atrocious in 2021, and it was one of the best in the conference in 2022. He did an amazing job, but he no longer has – that slew, uh, it's just not as deep in yeah. terms of the defensive backs they have on the back end. And I I, ju- I just wonder. And the other thing, too, Oregon State just went 10-3, and three, right? Yeah. Best season since 2006. They have never put together back-to-back 10-win seasons. Yeah. It's never happened. Now, maybe Jonathan Smith is the guy to do it. He He's certainly shown a lot of potential. He's made them into a real team in this conference. But your resources at Oregon State – are still limited. And, and do they have the recruiting depth? Do they have enough talent there to be able to sustain the defense at that level? I don't know. I think it's a very legitimate question to ask. It's hard to do. It's hard to feel good about something too. That's never happened before. It just as much as you might. Yeah, like, exa- I like, exactly. I like, the, I like DJU a lot. That's, and you mentioned it. Like he's not the question. I think he's going to be a lot of people's questions when it comes to Oregon state. My question is that defense, because like you said, that's just a lot of talent to lose. Yeah. And, and by the way, they weren't. And the other thing too, that secondary was so good. Oregon state was not a good team up front. They, they, they were yeah. not great against the run last year. They were great against the pass because in coverage, they were just ridiculously good and their schemes were really, really smart. But they don't have a great front four. So I what again- you just what, said, What you just said, you got to- Exactly, front four right? Exactly. Like I almost feel like that the defense playing at that high of a level doesn't mean they, they still can't be good, but can they be at that high of a level? I feel like that was an aberration from the norm because- if you can't generate pressure consistently, it's pretty tough to it, it, it it's pretty tough to see them being that good again. But you balance that with better quarterback play, yeah. maybe they're able to get on that level. But I, I feel like they're closer to an eight or nine win team than taking a step to being a, another ten or eleven win team. Yeah, I, I feel the exact same way just because of all the question marks, especially on the defensive side of the ball. But they're going to be fascinating. So closing our last two teams first, UCLA. I, I do think Dante Moore will win the job, but I, I just wonder how, and it, that's the question maybe a lot of people will still be asking is, is he going to win the job or either way? I just think quarterback is so yeah, uncertain. I don't know. The Bruins, it's, you know, you, you do think? 
you know? No, I no, I don't I don't know because Colin Schley is transferring from Kent State, which is a respectable, you know, ish G five conference well, and whatnot. Maction. Yeah, everybody loves some Tuesday Not night action, right? Who doesn't? But the question is, is that a guy that they brought in and guaranteed the job to, or is this a legitimate competition? Because yeah, I don't know how. How do you think Chip does it? Because I know I don't think Coach Witt does that. I think when he brings guys in, I think they have to earn it. It's tough to say because. You know, Chip Kelly redshirted Marcus Mariota mm-hmm. and then played him as a redshirt freshman, right? And they only had one year together in college, but that worked out pretty well. Yes, it did. So does he see Dante Moore and think, well, this is the way we do it, and mm-hmm. this is what we're going to do? I don't know. I, I really don't know. Because typically you add a transfer quarterback from a school like Kent State, it's because you think he's going to come in and be the starter. But that Dante Moore recruitment, that flipped on a dime. It did. So mm-hmm. that might not have been part of their long-term plans originally, but it might be now. And I, I think Dante Moore is as refined and polished of a quarterback as you could possibly find. But can he get to Schley's level? I don't know. I think that's a legitimate battle down there in Los Angeles. It, it absolutely is a legitimate battle. And it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out because, look, UCLA was obviously really good last year, and a huge part of that was DTR. So how will they do with someone new? And Charbonnet's not there either. So it's a lot of production to replace on the offensive side of the ball. Last team I still think is worth talking about. Those are the more the main team, especially coming off a of last season success. But, look, Deion Sanders is at Colorado, and there's a lot of excitement and intrigue around there. And we just saw first-year head coach at TCU, and Sonny Dykes really turned his program around. Now, I will say TCU, the program he took over, was in much better shape. than They, the were, a five, they were a five-win team, not the worst yes. Power 5 team in the last 20 exactly. years. Exactly. So that's my question is how good can this team be in Deion's first year? Can they – I mean, even five, even four more wins seems like it's that still seems like a lot to me. Like I four can't wins that. would be a good year. I agree. And I still think it seems like a lot, despite, you know, all the videos and everything we see and guys getting kicked out for not wearing the right sock combinations like they're being held to a championship standard, which I think is how you start in building a championship culture. But that it takes time to also build a championship culture. It's, there's a reason we just saw what Coach Dykes did. It's an aberration what he did in year yeah, one. And the that's not, helps, but it's still rare. Yeah, I, I, I understand people look at TCU and say, well, look at what you can do in a year. That's going from five wins to the national championship, and let me tell you, that's not the norm, right? That they is. They were just... so close to not even making it there. There were so many games. Exactly. That they were hanging on the so like TCU rare. is going to be a classic pullback team. Yes. I, I still expect them to be good. I bet yeah. you they win eight games. That's my yeah. prediction. I think TCU probably is an eight game winner this year. They yeah. lost uh, Johnson, their wide receiver to the NFL. Yes. They lost Max Duggan. You know, I think Chandler Morris is still there, but, you know, I watched him in the early part of the season. I was like, eh, I don't know. And then they ended up going with Duggan. That worked out pretty well. So I, I, I don't feel like Colorado is a team that gets over 500 this year. I know they've brought in a lot of talent, but you were starting with the most bare cupboards imaginable. There was not a single position group that you could look at in 2022 for the Buffs and say, well, at least they had this. Or at least, no, there was nothing. There, there was They were outmatched at every position. So when you're doing a total teardown like that in the Pac-12 in the state that it's currently in, I, I can't see them winning more than four games, right? Do I think they'll win more than one? Yeah, of course, right? Yes. They've got too much talent to not do that. And I think we're, we're going to get a real good sense on Colorado early in the year because they play at TCU and they also host Nebraska. If they win one of those games... Before they play, I think it's Colorado State or some FCS school that, that, that they'll beat. Like, if they beat Color or TCU or Nebraska, I would take them more seriously than I do right now. I expect them to be better. I think three or four wins is what they're probably looking at. But Dion is a great salesman. Mm-hmm. He's got a huge brand, of course. But there's so much work to be done at Colorado. There's a huge target on their back, too. Don't yeah, and I yeah, and I, I think that's 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 a part of it as well, which is a weird thing to say and mm-hmm. what makes it such a fascinating hire. It is going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. And another thing that's going to be interesting, real quick, Spencer, is the future of Pac-12 basketball because this is a year where UCLA is the only team from the Pac to make it into the Sweet 16. We saw Arizona State nearly get over the hump against TCU, saw USC fall to Michigan State. Um, we know Utah. I mean, this is locked on Utah. Utah is in a, was a really good spot for most of the basketball season, and then the last month of the season came and. Uh, their last win came February 11th, and after that, they didn't win the game on the season. So it is just kind of interesting, and I do think one thing that will help the pack and a lot of these other real reasons I feel like we're seeing so many upsets is you get so many fifth and sixth year guys out there that just have so much more experience than some of these higher recruits that 
it's helped them a little bit. So I do think some of that change will help teams like Oregon and USC get back a little bit when some of their younger guys won't be playing against guys who are, you got 18 year olds playing against 23 years old in some of these games. I think that disparity is really large and that'll still happen in some small instances because of those weird red shirts and injuries and all those different things. But either way, I just feel like for the pack to improve one thing, especially for Utah, it's got to get stronger is the guard play. I just see so many guards dominate. I think of the Kansas state game and how they're college basketball is all about guard play. Yes. Yeah. All the best bigs are gone from the tournament basically already. Yeah. Zach Eady, Purdue sound focal point of their offense. Nope. You know, when Purdue did better, Last year, when they had who? Jaden Ivey, guard. Mm -hmm. Guard play. It is all guard play. It is all guard play, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for the pack. So we'll see what they can do in the recruiting trail and if they can get back to being one of the powerhouses in terms of college basketball conferences. But either way, it's an uphill battle that's for a, them. That's a big uphill battle. Yeah. <laughs> big uphill battle. <laughs> and we'll see how it all plays out. Just like it's fun that we got spring football back. So if you guys are looking for more football content about the Pac-12, make sure you guys check out Locked On Pac-12 Podcast with Spencer McLaughlin. You guys can also follow him at Twitter, at Smalls underscore 55. Spencer, really appreciate you joining us. Hey, great to be on any time to come on and talk Utes in the Pac-12, JT. It's always great having you, Spencer. And thank you guys for making Locked On Utes your first listen every day. And we'll be back with you tomorrow.